Okay, and we're back yet again, and um, moving right along. Here's another one of those uh, more complicated uh, block diagrams, but in this case, it kind of walks you through the whole step on how this uh, geological environment sequence, cross section, if you will, came to exist. And it starts out number one, again, thinking bottom up, you know, down here at the bottom of A, and thinking towards the top. <clears throat> now, as you're looking at this, you got A, B, C, and B. E, well, if we look here, we get A, B, C, D, and E. Well, how do you know that this was the first sequence relative to what's going on here? Well, you'll notice that D, which happens to be an igneous intrusion of another type, has inclusions of both C and E, so they had to be there first. So this had, you know, here's what's going on in this environment. Original deposition of these four beds, then D came into place. You know, then we work through with E F coming in, cutting across another sort of igneous uh, mass <clears throat> that only goes up to a certain point, doesn't continue above, you know, this unconformity here. Um, so that's all happening here. Then the beds down here are tilted, okay, into its uh, almost final configuration. Then uh, there's also erosion going on at the surface. Then the area is you know, re-submerged, the oceans come in, more deposition occurs, uh, putting down more horizontal layers. So you have all these different formations with cross-cutting relations and superposition and original horizontality. In this case, inclusions, unconformities, it's all coming together and it explains it here how it happens. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. What we will do here is quickly look at the um, Grand Canyon in the Grand Canyon sequence and what's going on here. And basically everything except for inclusions is really at play in this diagram. Well, that we've talked about this far. We haven't talked about fossils or fossil uh, or faunal succession yet, but the rest of it's at play. So first of all, you can see the different types of unconformities. We have a nonconformity down here, igneous and metamorphic rocks in contact with sedimentary. The, uncon the uncar group is indeed sedimentary. We have an angular unconformity. These beds are at an angle relative to the horizontal beds sitting above it. And we have a series of disconformities up here where there have been time gaps as these rock units were being deposited through time. Okay, to interpret the sequence of these things, and looking down here at the bottom, what's the oldest? Well, this granite, Zoroaster, is actually cutting across and into the Vishnu schist. Okay? And the Vishnu schist is under everything else. So the Vishnu schist is the oldest, followed by the Zoroaster granite, followed by the creation of this nonconformity. Then the Ankar group was laid down. The area was tilted. That gives these tilted beds. Um, this surface was then exposed and eroded. Uh, so that sets the stage for making up this angular unconformity. Then the Tapetes sandstone, Bright Angel shale, and Mauve limestone, the Tonto group, were all deposited down on top of that um, unconformable surface, again making that angular unconformity. Then there's another time gap, this first disconformity between the Mauve sandstone and the red wall sandstone. <clears throat> then there's another time gap disconformity between the red wall and the supai group. And then from that point on, everything's pretty well conformable. There are no more time gaps. So the sup supai group, right, is young, excuse me, older than the hermit shale. The hermit shale is older than the coconino, older than the toro weep, older than the kaibab and modern, modern erosion is going up here. Now, you'll also notice over here, there, there's names given to uh, these different formations and when they occur. Things like the Precambrian, the Cambrian, the Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian. These are all names that are associated with the geologic time scale. Those names uh, originally established based on relative dating techniques. You know, we don't see any ages of what's going on here, just the relative relationships. And they're pretty much usually um, given, you know, such as you know, by Pennsylvanian rocks, well, a lot of Pennsylvanian aged rocks in Pennsylvania where they originally studied. Same thing with Mississippian, Cambria, 
uh, so forth and so on. So there's where these names actually come from. We'll talk about that in a little bit here, but let's move right along. So there are all those principles in action to unravel the geologic history of the Grand Canyon. Okay, cool. All right, quickly covering fossils. Well. Different types of organisms only live during certain pe periods of geologic time. You know, a, a perfect example of that is the dinosaurs. They lived in a time sequence basically called the Mesozoic, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And, you know, before that time they didn't exist. After that time that they became extinct at the what's referred to as a KT boundary. So we're only going to expect to find those fossils associated with those beings like the dinosaurs, you know, in certain beds. Okay. So we can actually use the presence of certain fossils of those organisms to help us again relatively date things, but more importantly, they can also do something else. They can allow us to correlate different geologic units over broad regions of geographic space. Okay, here's an example where, you know, we have a sequence of rocks that go throughout the southwestern US from Grand Canyon National Park up through Zion National Park and over to Bryce Canyon. The whole sequence is getting progressively younger as we go from area to area but we're able to use the characteristics of those rocks and the fossils presence in those rocks for relating things like the presence of the Kaibab limestone both at Grand Canyon and at Zion. The same thing with the Monocopy. Uh, okay, that's also in Grand Canyon in some places at the top of the section. It's also found over here in Zion. You know, we'll look for the types of rocks you'd expect. Sometimes the type of rock may change. It may be sedimentary, but it might change from being one sort of sandstone or shale into another. But the fossils that are, you know, associated with the organisms that are present in those particular rocks may help us along with that correlation. Again, going from Zion to Bryce Canyon, you know, we're looking at the Navajo sandstone. It has some very peculiar uh, characteristics associated with it. The same thing with the Carmel Formation. Okay, both the nature of those rocks and the fossils contained within them allow the correlation of those rocks over a very broad region. Okay, so another use of fossils. Okay. Okay, now we're going to get into um, absolute dating, but again, I'm sitting here at seven and a half minutes almost, just over seven and a half minutes, so I'm going to quit this sequence. You know, here comes another video, and uh, we'll get ready for the next video here in a moment.